Well, hello, I'm Nancy, and this is the OWASP DevSlop Show. On today's show, Head of Security Research at R2C, Clint Glib Gibbler, sorry, will present SEMGRAP, an open source lightweight static analysis tool that promises to effectively scale your company's, company's security by eliminating vulnerability classes. But first, a short message from today's show sponsor, Bridge Crew. Security is a software problem that isn't being solved like one. That's why we started Bridge Crew. Our platform connects with your cloud infrastructure to quickly identify security issues. With continuous automation, you can always trust that you are in line with cloud security best practices. Start automating your cloud security with Bridge Crew for free. Hi guys. Hi. So I am going to give an introduction. Hello again, everyone. Hello, Nancy. Hello, Nikki. I am Tanya and I'm here for the OWASP DevSlop show where we meet industry practitioners who join us to teach us something cool and new and often around DevOps and the security of it. If you are new here, please make sure to subscribe to our channel and enable your notifications. And also, if you're having a good time, click the thumbs up button. Note that all the important information that we discussed today will be added to the description box below so that you do not miss it. Nikki? Thanks, Tanya. Hi, everyone. Our guest today is Clint Gibbler. Clint is the head of research for R2C, a startup working on giving security tools directly to developers. Prior, Clint was the research director at NCC Group, a global consulting firm where he helped companies implement security automation and DevSecOps best practices, as well as performing penetration tests for companies ranging from large to new startups. But Clint is an all around great guy in the AppSec space and we all love him very much. So welcome, Clint. We do, Clint's the best. Really, so, we, we, thanks so much. We really adore Clint, we just do. Yeah. <laughs> we think he's great. <laughs> I am a weekly reader of TLDR. Like I read through the whole thing. It's a great yeah, newsletter. So, yeah. Oh, Makes it easy to quit Twitter actually, yeah. right? I don't feel so bad not to check my Twitter feed because I know Clint will summarize the whole week for me. <laughs> <laughs> you spend a lot of time uh, reading things. So happy to save you some time. Awesome. <laughs> All right, so. It's so lovely to join you all. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I don't know, at first I was nervous, but then I was like, oh, I'm just gonna get to hang out uh, with my buds. So uh, yeah. glad to be here. Absolutely, cool. Kelly, virtual, virtual version, <laughs> just us. Yeah. <laughs> the last time we all saw each other was in January of this year, which is, as Clint said, 100 years ago now. Yeah, at least. Or at least, maybe it was, yeah. All right, so what are we gonna talk about today, Clint? Cool. Um, yeah, let me uh, share my screen. Um, so basically, I wanted to uh, tell you a bit about uh, an open source tool uh, my company's been building and sort of some different applications of it. And um, like a little bit of uh, ideas um, about sort of uh, my views on AppSec and sort of the future of AppSec that's been largely influenced by uh, like a ton of other uh, smart people. And uh, yeah, most of this, I would like to just do like some live demos and uh, hang out and have fun. So yeah. Uh, also, if you want to follow along, uh, if you go to this bit.ly link at the top, uh, you can see the slides that I'm showing you right now. Um, yeah, so uh, also I've moved uh, you all to uh, my top monitor. So if I'm uh, staring uh, straight up into the sky, it's because uh, I'm looking at you, just uh, FYI. Um, yeah, so uh, I wanted to start with a, a perhaps too ambitious claim. Um, so uh, I would like to say that not just uh, we'll sort of walk through how to write um, custom SEMGREP rules, which is an open source static analysis tool. Uh, I also am going to claim that uh, you all, not me, uh, are going to write a rule to find something interesting uh, in a code base that is uh, an unauthenticated route in a Flask web application. Um, so my goal is in the next hour, and by the way, this is not the only thing we're going to talk about, but just in part of it, um, I'd like you to go from zero to being able to do this. So we'll see uh, if it works. Um, you know, maybe maybe this is claiming too much, but uh, we'll see. <laughs> um, 
Um, OK, yeah, uh, I'm not going to belabor this. Uh, you already talked about it quite ex excellently. Um, uh, we have uh, at the bottom here uh, an obligatory Zoom company photo, uh, <laughs> which is uh, applicable these days. Um, yeah, so currently at R2C, we're building an open source static analysis tool that we'll talk about today. Um, I also have a newsletter, uh, tldrsec.com, where I sort of spend uh, overly too much time uh, reading uh, Reddit, Hacker News, Twitter, and just trying to absorb as many security things as possible and sort of distill it down uh, into one place. Um, yeah, so grad student, I dressed like this. Uh, when I was, uh, now that I've moved to San Francisco, obviously I have to uh, dress like a hipster. So I just wanted to give you a, a little flavor of uh, my wardrobe uh, evolving over time. Um, so I want to, I wanted to, you know, be not very ambitious in this. So you know, start off. Uh, I thought we could question some fundamental assumptions of the security industry. Um, then I'll tell you like a little bit about Semgrep, and then we'll do, do some demo, um, some rule writing, and then integrating into CI. Uh, and then yeah, feel free to interrupt me whenever. Um, this is like uh, uh, not super formal. Just like if any time something I say is unclear, just uh, let me know. Um, OK, so cool. let's talk a little bit about um, sort of how things are changing, I think, in the security industry. And I like to think of it as sort of analogous for like how uh, tech has changed, right? So going from waterfall to agile, separate dev and ops to DevOps, from on-prem to cloud. And I think security is similarly going through um, a massive shift, at least in AppSec. Specifically, I think previously there was this big focus on finding vulnerabilities. And going forward, I see this heavy emphasis on uh, secure defaults, um, whereby, you know, rather like, how do we find all the bugs? But just like, hey, let's like build a secure by default way and just make sure everyone uses it. And ideally, that way we're solving sort of classes of problems rather than playing a bug whack-a-mole. Um, OK, so quick quiz. Um, let's say I gave you a random web app, and I asked you, you know, does this have cross-site scripting in it? Um, yeah, so would you say yes. like? Yes. <laughs> OK. <laughs> You, you'd probably be right. Um, but like basically, you probably have a lot of questions, right? You'd say, like, well, like, what does the user control? What's the structure of that data? Does the web app like filter the data? How is it stored in the database? Like, is it stored as like ints or floats, or is it strings or maybe arbitrary JSON? Uh, coming back from the database, like what does the web app do with the data? Uh, and then when it's outputted to um, the user's browser, like is that user input inserted into HTML or an HTML attribute or JavaScript? Like, there's probably like a lot of questions you have uh, about a web app to know. Like, does this uh, potentially have a cross-site scripting vulnerability? But what if I were to tell you sort of this property of the web app that's like, okay, all the front end code is in React, and we've banned the function dangerously set in our HTML, which basically turns off uh, output encoding such that user input could be interpreted uh, as malicious JavaScript. So like, let's say that you know I, I gave you this web app. Uh, it's maybe like three million lines of code. Um, you have no idea what's in it. You've never looked at it. But if I were to tell you this property, probably like a lot of these things that you used to care about are a lot less important now. Like, maybe it's not a hundred percent secure, but it's like probably pretty good, or at least it's not like this black box of unknowing, um, yep. like it was before, right? So, um, really, I think of this as like two sides of the same coin. Right? So it's like on one side, it's like, well, we could try to prove the security of something by trying to find as many bugs as possible. Or we could have sort of like, well, for all these problem classes, we have like a safe, established way to do it. And then we just make it very easy for developers to do it. And then we just have sort of lightweight checks to make sure that they're doing it. Um, so it's like the same problem. We're just tackling it from a different angle. Um, and I like to think of this as sort of like, what are you trying to do? Like, what's your task versus like how much effort does that take? And uh, the y axis is uh, CHUs or uh, Clint's hand wavy units is uh, the official metric. Um, and <laughs> I'm watching the Tanya. Uh, uh, so, <laughs> like, <laughs> so, like, it's very easy to say, like, are mm -hmm. we, um, is this using sort of the secure version of a library or the insecure version? Like that's pretty easy, right? That's almost just grep or like sort of a smarter grep. Uh, and then we have like finding a potential bug. It's harder. Confirming if something is a real bug is even harder. And then writing a proof of concept exploit where it's like actually exploiting the issue is even harder, right? And sort of what, what I'm getting at here is like just detecting either the use or lack of use of secure defaults is just fundamentally much easier, right? Than finding bugs. Um, 
Because a lot of times when you're finding bugs, uh, you're not 100% sure, which sort of leads to why there's uh, many false positives in common sort of static and dynamic analysis tools. Um, so I wanted to make sure to connect to the youth uh, tuning in. So sort of the, the, the one slide for this is, you know, broke is finding every vulnerability and woke is uh, preventing classes of vulnerabilities. And, and that's sort of really like, I think the thesis of this. Um, Question, okay. yeah, yeah. just real quick. So it's the secure defaults, right? Totally makes sense. Like the React, you know, you could prevent all of that malicious JavaScript from executing in React. What about like more upstream defaults, secure, like secure defaults, like CSPs and things like that. Do you take those into account, into account when you're thinking about secure defaults or it's really just language specific? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think you can think of it at many levels. Um, so yeah, there's like upstream stuff, like is your framework, like say uh, you're using React or like a modern version of Rails or Django or things like that. Uh, those often have nice secure defaults built in. So you can think of it as like a, uh, a framework level. You also have some sort of language level, right? Where, um, uh, for example, in sort of modern languages that manage memory for you, like you don't have sort of standard buffer overflows um, like in C uh, and things like that in sort of like modern interpreted languages. Um, there's also like, you know, uh, protections built into browsers. Um, but, I, but I think these are just examples. There's also, uh, for example, in my conversations with many companies, they've spent a lot of time thinking like, okay, what are things that are potentially dangerous? Like say parsing XML or uh, storing secrets or things like that. And basically they have custom internal libraries that are then used by developers so that, you know, every developer doesn't have to figure out how to uh, securely parse XML without XXE or some other vulnerability. Um, and really sort of the security team is like, how do, what are the sort of primitives? Like what are the types of functionality that uh, developers need to do? And then how can I make it very trivial for them to do that securely using either sort of popular third party libraries or like custom internal things uh, that either wrap sort of a uh, more dangerous standard library or or just like um, uh, are from scratch. Mm -hmm. But yeah, does that uh, answer your question? Yeah, yeah, so, so, so totally. Like the mechanics don't necessarily matter as long as it's repeatable and reusable and you can distribute it at scale to your development environment. Who cares if it's a really well-formed CSP or disabling certain features in React, right? It's sort of the same kind of problem solving technique. Yeah, yeah, it's really just like, like how do we, um, how do we enable and empower developers to do their job uh, where security is just sort of transparent? Like, totally. um, like sort of a, a metaphor uh, or uh, like an allegory, I guess I like to think is like, think about say um, uh, airbags in cars, like you just drive and you don't know how they work, but like they keep you safe. Uh, but there is actually a lot of like fancy engineering that goes uh, on behind the scenes. So for example, if like you're going super fast the airbag needs to uh, expel at greater velocity than if you're going very slow. Like if it were to do like max velocity when you're like only driving 30 miles an hour, uh, it would like like snap your neck. But if you're going like super fast and it doesn't expel very uh, with a lot of strength, then like it's not enough to protect you and you'll hit the dashboard, right? So there's like all this like engineering that's been put into that to make it safe transparently for you. And I think similarly, um, we need to put a little bit more of the onus on us as security professionals to like how can we like provide that level of sort of quality of service to uh, developers and, and help them do what they're great at, which is building, uh, you know, functionality that makes uh, our company's money uh, and sort of like, uh, you know, high scale robust systems, right? Like I can't do that uh, as a security professional. So, you know, how can I enable them to do what they're good at um, and not have to care about the things I'm good at is sort of the core idea. There is a question in the chat. And so first of all, people like your airbags and someone else commented that they like your beard. So now <laughs> the importantness is out of the way. Cool. Um, Adrian is asking, is this DevOps applied to security, right? Like fast feedback and um, emphasizing the speed of the entire system. So is this DevOps applied to security? What do you think, Clint? Uh, totally. Yeah, I think that uh, sort of like DevSecOps or sort of modern application security is taking a lot of the lessons from DevOps. Like how do we, yeah, how do we get Quick feedback, how do we iterate rapidly? Um, things that I think security has historically been bad at and sort of like, well, we have these tools that take a long time to run or we do a pen test once a year. Uh, yeah, I think a lot of the sort of principles and ideas that make DevOps so effective uh, are being applied to security now, um, uh, partly because people want to, partly because they have to, because the previous approach just fundamentally doesn't work in many companies. Um, yeah, so short answer, yes. Yeah, I agree. Um, sometimes I tease people and I say, oh, are you doing water fail? still and they get annoyed 
But um, it's true. I totally agree with you so much, Clint. Yeah, absolutely. And also, um, I guess the third way is continuous learning, of the third way of DevOps. And that's what we're doing right now from you. <laughs> this yeah. is like a lot of win happening here. Okay, I'll, I'll let you continue. I just felt like you really need to know that your beard looks good and also your airbag example is awesome. And yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I, I spent uh, many hours uh, quaffing my beard this morning, so I, uh, I appreciate it. <laughs> it's paid off. <laughs> I was like, I could work on the slides or I could work on my beard, uh, and I'm glad I made the right investment. Um, so, so, so far, this has been sort of like hand wavy, and uh, one thing that I like to think sometimes is like, okay, so like, what are the fang, like sort of the, uh, these like massive tech companies that have, you know, super large budgets, they have big teams full of very smart people, they have executive buy-in to security, uh, they're just organizationally willing to pursue these long-term strategic initiatives if they deem them high value. And they've thought about this problem space a lot, right? So like so far it's been like, okay, this is maybe Clint's opinion, um, but like what are other people thinking? Um, so again, I'm, I'm not gonna belabor these uh, for time, but um, here's a, a talk by Scott and Isha uh, of Netflix, which I think is really great. I encourage you to check out, notice like what they're prioritizing. Like one of the key things is secure by default and notice how this is growing over time. Um, here's a blog post by Microsoft where they discussed when they were transitioning from XP to Vista. Basically, there's a sort of a handful of like dangerous C functions, and they just basically like banned a bunch of them, and like that reduced like a huge majority uh, of the vulnerabilities in the transition. Uh, this is from a uh, SRE book from Google um, where they say like, hey, it's unreasonable to expect developers to just be security experts. You know, a better way is uh, to do these common frameworks, languages, and libraries. Um, such that they make basically certain kinds of vulnerabilities uh, impossible, just sort of uh, if you use them. Uh, here's uh, a blog post from Facebook where um, sort of they have this like inverted pyramid about like what they sort of prioritize uh, most is at the top and then sort of other layered things at the bottom. Uh, and again, note like secure frameworks is sort of like the number one thing here. So, um, so again, these companies uh, are not really limited by like people or budgets, um, at least compared to any of us, uh, but you know, again, this is something they've invested in. Um, so if you're interested in like trying to tackle specific vulnerability classes, uh, my colleague Isaac and I gave a talk at this past uh, Global AppSec SF uh, about it. So feel free to uh, check out these slides as well. Um, okay, so uh, that's just like a bit of sort of the context uh, about how I think about things, uh, but let's get a little bit into SimGrep. Um, so actually it, Origins uh, are actually at Facebook. Um, so I think in like 2009 or so, um, Yuan, one of Facebook's first program analysis hires, actually built this tool called Sgrep, which has become Semgrep. Um, and they actually used it internally to enforce uh, over 1,000 uh, secure coding patterns. Um, so it's sort of like customizable, lightweight. Um, it's batteries included. There's, I think, a little bit over 1,000 uh, rules that are open source you get out of the box. And sort of the core idea is like, can we combine combine the speed and customization of grep with something a bit more powerful like traditional SAS. Now, can we get the, the benefits of sort of both of those worlds? Um, so you can run it offline uh, on your machine via like CLI or Docker. Um, you don't need to compile code to run it. Um, yeah, Nikki, do you have a... Oh, never mind. I, I was laughing about batteries included with hundreds of existing <laughs> community rules. I'm just like, I love your sense of humor so much and I'm just trying not to make giggles. <laughs> So, but all right, I, I got a question. Yeah. Is it a thing that runs, like it's a binary that exists somewhere that has to do things? Uh, yes. Um, okay. Yeah. So you can uh, just like run it locally on your machine. Uh, we have a web app where you can sort of like uh, not install anything, but just like write rules right in your browser. Uh, and it, it just sort of like uh, forks some like Docker in the background to run it for you. Um, or you can run it in CI. Um, yeah, so you can run it just locally on your machine, CI, like wherever. It's uh, just like a standalone binary. Um, and I think the, the most compelling thing uh, about it is that it, there's no sort of painful domain specific language you have to learn to use it. Um, so with a lot of tools, it's like, well, it's very powerful, but it's gonna take you a couple of days or maybe a couple of weeks to really understand like how to use it. And I think sort of our core thesis as a company is like, how do we take these sort of like very advanced ideas and tools and then make them as simple as possible for people so that like basically anyone who can write code, uh, not just security people, but also developers, like can we give them sort of this power um, yeah. Like so, it. where and, would it where would it go? Like, would you do this um, against a code base? Like, let's say, would you do it 
against your code repo or would you do it like as part of a pipeline or would this be so like a lot of SAS tools that I've used like static application mm -hmm. security testing tools it's where you have like this big engagement and this expert comes in and it takes like a couple weeks like can you explain to us the flow of like an ideal way that I could potentially use this later <laughs> <laughs> Sure. I mean, so, I mean, anyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, let's say you like have some code on your machine and you're like, cool, I want to scan it. Uh, then you could just like uh, brew install or pip install or use Docker to just like run it locally on your machine. Um, if you were, say, like doing a code review or auditing a, a repo, um, that's like an easy, lightweight way to get started. Um, but if you're like, oh, uh, I tried this, I like it a lot, I want to. Uh, scan, for example, every pull request that comes uh, to one or more repos, then you could set it up as like a GitHub action or a GitLab runner or Jenkins or BuildKite or CircleCI or sort of whatever you want. Um, okay. So if you're sort of like one off like exploratory or doing a code review or something like that, you just want to do it on your machine. Uh, that's very easy to do. But if you want sort of continuous coverage, you can also uh, integrate it into CI, which we will do uh, today. So my question kicked off so many questions in the chat. Is it okay if we like kind of like hammer <laughs> yeah. this part of the, <laughs> okay. Yeah, so free. Arpita asks, how does it affect performance and how much longer does a CI scan take with SEMGREP enabled per repo? And obviously like you can't say, oh, it'll be exactly 30 seconds because every repo is the same size. But if you were comparing it perhaps to other people or other yeah. tools. Uh, so we'll see it running live uh, in a bit. Um, but one thing that's nice is uh, it's like pretty fast. So there's a couple of things that make it fast. Um, so one is uh, it's running on source code. It doesn't require sort of a buildable environment, that, which can take a lot of time for sort of traditional SaaS tools. Um, it also uh, analyzes like just the code that's changed. So you don't need to like scan the whole repo. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'd say like anecdotally, probably like, um, like tens of seconds to minutes. Um, like for us, we scan all of our code on it, and it's like often not the slowest linting thing. Like if we have like integration tests or something like that, that can take um, like minutes or something like that. Like SendGrep will also take like minutes. Okay. So so yeah, if you have like you know millions of lines <clears throat> of code and you're running like lots of checks against all of the millions of lines of code, it could take maybe like minutes or like ten or fifteen minutes or something. But if you're like just scanning a diff. Um, in CI, it's like probably minutes. Honestly, like GitHub loading the sort of uh, the Docker image to do the scan uh, is often like a significant portion of the total scan time, not like the actual SEMGREP okay. doing it itself. When um, you're scanning cool. the, the Delta, so, so there's like a lot, so that has exploded into so many questions. And I get, since I'm asking them, I get to ask mine first. So like, if you're just scanning the Delta, so the part that's the changed code, what if that code um, like the changed code affects some other function somewhere else. Does it verify how this changed code affects all the other areas of the code? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so uh, let's see, actually. Uh, Sorry, yeah, I let didn't me... mean to like, just like stab you with that question. Like I was like, that's a pretty hard question, but I was like, ooh, I get excited. No, that, that's a great question. So uh, I traveled back in time and heard your question and created this slide for it. Um, so, so uh, one thing that um, some people are not aware of, but uh, so static analysis is not actually just like a like a binary yes or no. There's actually like a range and complexity of static analysis. So like regex, uh, <laughs> like grep is static analysis. It's it's just very mm -hmm. simple. It's it's not aware of code structure. And then on the sort of right hand side here, uh, you have sort of this very advanced like whole program analysis. This is sort of like traditional SAST where you're doing a uh, control and data flow uh, across say dozens of files and you know thousands uh, of lines of code. So SEMGREP is actually sort of in the middle. So it is uh, aware of source code structure, but it's, it's focused on sort of a uh, more localized analysis. So it sort of is considering mostly like one file at a time uh, rather than trying to do um, uh, sort of whole program analysis. Um, so to answer your question, um, it uh, in the future, it may do analyses across many files, but currently its um, analysis is more localized. And sort of the, the philosophy behind that is that if someone makes a change and you need to um, like reason about say 10 files to understand if that's secure, that perhaps there's bigger coding standards or practices that you should change such that like, like 
Right. So like when you when a developer is doing a code review, they're not like, oh, you changed this function. Let me read a hundred other files. No, they're probably like, okay, let me let me look at this file and see if it's secure. So in an ideal world and the world that we're hoping to promote and make real is that uh, you can reason about security properties more locally, such that um, you know you, you don't need sort of this full program analysis. And also, when you're doing data flow across many files, this is a common reason why sort of false positives occur, because there's sort of fundamental reasons uh, in static analysis where you sort of make approximations. You're like, I don't know if this function is actually calling this function because of like uh, various sort of like uh, uh, program analysis theory reasons. But ba basically, it's like. The analysis is localized so that it can be fast and ideally more precise. So like that has exploded more questions. I'm sorry. Is it, it like, I know I'm interrupting your presentation, but that's, that's okay. like, really good questions. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So you were just talking about false positives and Ma Ma Magno asks, um, is there any research around false positive compared to regular SAS tools, like how SEMGREP does in comparison? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so uh, false positive uh, research in general is an interesting problem because uh, if you read the uh, EULA of many commercial SaaS tools, it explicitly says you may not publish information about your false positives and you may not publicly benchmark various tools. It, read a bunch of EULAs, you'll, you'll find these. Uh, most popular vendors actually say this. Um, Anecdotally, uh, a number of companies who have used uh, SEMGREP have found that uh, it tends to be a little bit higher signal in practice because the sets of problems we're aiming to tackle uh, are more sort of um, specific and tractable. Um, I guess from my anecdotal experience doing security consulting at NCC Group, where a number of the projects I did actually, uh, a company was like, hey, we're paying this vendor, uh, the SaaS vendor, like six figures a year, and we're not getting a lot of value. Could you help me uh, make it better? And uh, in my experience, oftentimes findings that are chained across many, many files uh, are more likely to be false positive, where things that were only like two or three um, were likely to be uh, true positive. Um, yeah. So yeah, so that's uh, very anecdotal. I don't have hard metrics for you, um, but that's, I think, intuition that I found to be true in practice. That is super interesting that you are not allowed to list false positives, because that yeah. certainly says something about it. Can, uh, can can we integrate SEMGREP with SonarCube? Someone was asking because I guess they use SonarCube and SonarCube's really popular. And is it possible to kind of like integrate one into the other? That's a good question. Um, yeah, if SonarCube allows you to run arbitrary like CLI tools, then yes. Yeah. So so SEMGREP, One thing nice about being very portable, um, like you don't need some sort of like massive separate server that's running it. Um, so it is pretty easy to integrate into sort of whatever you use currently. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, I'm not super familiar with uh, extending SonarCube, but if it's possible to run like an arbitrary sort of CLI tool, um, SimGrep does have like a dash dash JSON option. So you can just like output the results in sort of an easily parsable format and then pipe it wherever you want. Um, so while I, I haven't done that personally, my answer is like probably yes. Um, yeah, we, we've had different companies integrate SEMGREP into like their existing uh, sort of custom homegrown internal tools. Um, they're like, hey, we already do this thing. Can you add it? And we're like, cool, just add one line where you like uh, call the CLI and output JSON and cool, you're done. So question, is SEMGREP all rules-based or is there some sort of engine that is like the initial sort of engine and then you can supplement that with rules or is the whole thing rules-based? Uh, that's a good question. So. Uh, I would say basically every static analysis tool, uh, not just SEMGREP, uh, is basically two parts conceptually. I mean, uh, there's many subparts, but sort of conceptually there's two parts, which is like uh, an engine uh, and then uh, rules. So basically the engine is responsible for taking the source code and turning it into a uh, basically an abstract representation, either like a tree or a graph. And then the rules are then provided as sort of like domain specific knowledge, which then the engine applies to try to find uh, vulnerabilities or bugs. Got it. Okay, so you can context your code using specific rules around whatever that framework language, et cetera, is. Yeah, yeah. So SEMGREP and every static analysis tool is basically an engine and rules. Yep. Okay. Cool. Okay. Um, so people are there's so <clears throat> many questions. People are like super into this, and that's awesome. Um, so yes, for everyone, the recording will be available after the show. DevSlop always does that. All of our stuff's always available, so that's cool. 
Nancy, that I'm saying the truth, right? That's correct. Oh. 100% true. Okay. Yeah, everything's on the channel. Yeah, we're OWASP. That's what we do. Um, <laughs> and so people are asking, so how is it kind of different than a traditional linter? And and I'm, I'm thinking the same thing. And also, have you ever tried integrating it into an IDE? Because that would be cool. Cool. Uh, yeah, the linters, uh, let me talk about in a second. And uh, there's already a VS Code extension. So yes. Awesome sauce. Um, OK, so there's just so many questions. Um, oh, so someone was saying, so similar to false positives, have you found that there are a lot of false negatives? Like, do you feel like a lot of things are being potentially missed with, um, I guess, if you're looking for this subset of rules, are you finding false negatives with them often or not? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, so uh, I guess to, I to give you- I realize that puts you in a conflict <clears throat> of interest since you work there, sorry. No, uh, <laughs> you'll see, like I, I, I talk pretty raw about everything, like I, I don't care. Um, I, I guess like one thing that I find nice about R2C <laughs> is like, based on my experiences consulting, I was like, this is a thing I wish existed. And then I just so happened to find a company building the thing I wish existed. So it wasn't like, oh, I'm all about SEMgrep because uh, I decided to join R2C. It was more like a tool like X should exist. And I had like 10 properties. Uh, and then I was like, oh, they're just already building it and much smarter than me. So I should just join them. Um, uh, yeah, so so in terms of like false negatives, um, in general, that's a hard problem for any type of automated program analysis. Um, there's like uh, something called like Rice's theorem, uh, which basically it's like provably impossible to both find every bug and to be 100% precise. And that is there's no false positives. But anyway, blah, 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 academic theory. Um, I, I would say um, if you are looking for, say, um, like vulnerabilities that are spanning like many different files, uh, that is something that currently we're just not considering in scope. Um, if one way that we decrease false negatives in practice is when we are writing rules. Um, so we actually have this internal platform um, that's, you can think of it like MapReduce for code. Um, so basically what we do is we create input sets of like uh, thousands to tens or hundreds of thousands of GitHub repos. And then we write, we're like in the process of writing a new rule. And then we basically say, okay, apply this rule across these, you know, 10,000 most popular, say Flask uh, repos on GitHub. And then we just look like, okay, cool. Here's some things we found. Uh, these are correct. Oh, here's some false positives. Okay, let's make the rule better um, so that we don't find these anymore. Or like, oh, um, because I'm manually auditing it, like I would have expected to find this, but I didn't. It's a false negative. So let me improve the rule um, so that uh, it does find it. So I would say uh, a lot of the rules we write uh, personally are based on sort of hard wor real world data based on GitHub repos. Um, but uh, yeah, so I would say uh, it's impossible to know in the general case um, for any tool, not just SEMgrep, but um, uh, we do take uh, a number of steps to make sure that hopefully they're low in practice. Uh, but I think one powerful thing about SEMgrep, which we'll get to in a second, is like it's very easy to write your own rules and it's very easy to extend current rules. So whereas with other tools, you may be a bit limited to like, oh, if it doesn't work out of the box, like sort of game over. Um, the people on this call who've, uh, I think, have never written a SEMgrep rule before uh, will before the end. <laughs> so let's <laughs> let's say I have I really need to have a very, very high level of security assurance. So let's say it's like a mission critical app and it's super sensitive data and all of this. Would it make, so this is a question I'm stealing from the chat, but I'm just giving you background on it. So like, mm -hmm. would it make sense to use a traditional SaaS tool plus SEMgrep together to have like that higher level of assurance or is like just SEMgrep handling it and I don't need any <laughs> other SaaS tool anymore? Yeah. Um... Say it depends. Um, so my argument, like if you are building a really high assurance system, like really that's going to be a long-term process involving a lot of um, investment in sort of security fundamentals and principles, uh, like libraries and frameworks that make uh, many classes of issues um, just impossible. Um, but if you're say, if you have like a massive say legacy C code base or something like that, where you know there's foot guns everywhere, um, I would say then it might be useful to use um, uh, an additional tool that can look for sort of like standard um, uh, sort of flows that are flowing across many files because it's like, ah, we don't really have time to like backport um, uh, all these uh, sort of security 
properties. Um, but it, I would say if you're using a like a modern framework and you're willing to sort of invest in security engineering, I feel like SendGrep uh, handles that case very nicely. But if you have like massive uh, legacy code bases in languages without um, sort of a, a nice security uh, posture out of the out of the gate, for example, like C or C++, then I would say uh, another tool may be useful to use in conjunction. Cool. I <laughs> like your answers. And we are actually, we did, oh, no, a question just happened. Just as I was like, we've answered all the questions. It's I think we're going to get here, though. It's a question yeah, about full writing, right? We're yeah, Nikki, there. do you want to do it? Cool. Yeah. I, I don't think I can answer it. I think we're going to answer it is the answer. Yeah. It's basically, yeah. how are the rules written for SEMGREP? SEMGREP, is it an analogous to a JSON config file or to a language specific function, depending on the tech stack of the code base you're scanning? Yeah, I think uh, you're showing that, right? Cool, uh, yeah, yeah so we maybe will- Maybe you should just show us. Yeah, we'll, we'll do that <laughs> in a second. Um, uh, short story is uh, the rules you write are basically like the language you're targeting. So if you're trying to target Python, you're gonna write Python. If you're trying to target Java, it's gonna look like Java with a couple of helpful uh, abstractions. Um, and uh, basically the rules themselves are actually YAML that um, uh, sort of like combines the snippets. <clears throat> but basically we'll look at this in a second. Um, cool. So Let's I'm gonna I'm gonna like do blaze it. through uh, a couple of things. Um, totally messed up your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, all these questions have been wonderful. Awesome. Um, so I guess one one idea that we're also trying to work on is like how do we take sort of static coding standards if they're on like a wiki or in the code itself or your brain and how do we take those like implicit assumptions and codify them and roll them out continuously, right? Like. It's like, hey, we have documented on our wiki, like, hey, new developers, please like do this. Um, but like, you might not remember it, or like, there's a lot of things on your mind. And so, how do we like make this happen continuously? So, um, one thing that I think is interesting is um, when we presented to AppSec teams at different companies, a number of them have said, hey, this is awesome. Can you like give another presentation to like uh, our developer productivity team or our engineering team because they see value for it as well? Because it's we are mostly focused on security right now, uh, just as a company, uh, because we think it's like a nice initial use case. But really, it's just like a nice way to find code, um, which is useful for anyone, right? It's like, how do you make writing linters very easy, right? So it's like, hey, can we help developers get up to speed faster, uh, enable them to ship higher quality code faster, you know, in, uh, have a high code quality bar, uh, and so forth. So do. Um, uh, I think that people are often like, oh, how does this fit in with other tools? So I just created sort of like a sort of a, a cheat sheet in terms of like, which has open source rules. So traditional, like say Fortify, Checkmarks, Vera code, um, all of these players tend not to have open source rules. Uh, CodeQL does, which is great. Um, uh, SEMGREP, to my knowledge, is the only um, basically open source engine as mm -hmm. well. Um, CodeQL is free on open source repos, but I don't believe anything but SEMGREP is free to test on closed source repos. That is your company's proprietary stuff. Um, and then uh, a lot of things have sort of a, like a, a SaaS app that now uh, enables you to like see results and metrics and dashboards and like basically uh, configure running it across many things. Um, so that's not open source for SEMGREP because uh, that's how we're going to make money. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, oh, I love it. So and, and I'll show you that in a second. But it's basically like how do we solve enterprise uh, business problems? And I was also like, what's the most annoying visual I could find with? Uh, with uh, money raining. Um, so another thing I just want to quickly mention, uh, obviously we're huge fans of OWASP um, and we've actually been like, we're in like initial chats with uh, ASVS and Cheat Sheets, uh, those projects, because they're awesome. Um, so one thing we're working on is like, for people who are a fan of ASVS, can we make it just like, oh, can I automatically detect if um, my code base is sort of compliant to ASVS level one? Uh, and ideally we want to make it super trivial to find code that violates Cheat Sheets best practices. Um, so maybe even in VS Code in your IDE, your developers can be like hacking away and be like, oh, hey, you're not following sort of OWASP best practices. So, so it's like not like this PDF or website that you have to navigate and remember. It's like, oh, you just get um, sort of constant uh, in IDE feedback. Um, so uh, Daniel, Joe, Rohit, and many others uh, have been working on this. Like it, it's definitely not just me or just R2C. Um, yeah, so this is uh, a pull request on the OWASP Cheat Sheets project where uh, Rohit very kindly uh, was integrating uh, SEMGREP rules specifically for uh, XML external entity injection, uh, XXE. 
Um, so yeah, so we uh, are super excited about this that uh, Rohit just on his own uh, decided to do this. Um, so we are hoping to have many more uh, collaborations soon. So cool. Um, let's do demos, because uh, I feel like that's more exciting. Yeah, let's um, do demos. Let's do it. Yeah, so here's um, here's like a couple of things. Here's just like our R2C homepage. Um, so semgrep.dev is sort of like the landing page for semgrep itself. Mm -hmm. um, so it works for a number of languages like Golang, Java, JavaScript, Python, Ruby, TypeScript. Um, we're always adding new languages. So if you don't see your language of choice there yet, uh, we will be. Uh, I think C and PHP are sort of like provisionally supported. Um, and let's see what else. So yeah, if you want to like check out the source code, um, let me make this a little bit bigger for you. You can go to uh, did you, return did to you say PHP is supported or is not supported? Uh, I think it's like alpha status. Um, yeah. Yeah. So we have like sort of like flagship uh, languages that are like very well supported. And then as we add new languages, like <laughs> initially, um, they may not have quite all of the features that other languages have, um, but like we gradually improve them. So. Basically, uh, PHP will work uh, to some extent, but it's sort of not like officially sort of general availability. Uh, so yeah, so I'd say give it a try. Yes, uh, it mostly works, but you may encounter um, some bugs. Uh, but if you do, you can just file an issue, and then uh, we can fix it. OK, question two, sorry. Is this going to event? So like OWASP, we, we love OWASP, right? That's why we have an OWASP project. Yeah. Um, Defect Dojo, are you going to eventually work with them so that like you can import all of those results into Defect Dojo for metric magic? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so I haven't kept touch. Uh, I, I'm not sure about the latest of this, but I believe the Defect Dojo project may have already integrated SimGrep on their own. Um, or at least that process oh, has started. Nice. I feel like it's done, but I'm not sure. Um, so don't quote oh. me on that, but I believe I saw mentions of it um, yeah, it's either already integrated or it's like in process, uh, I think. Please continue. Thank you. Cool. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, so a couple of other things. Um, so I'm going to like show you some features, um, but we have pretty extensive docs. Um, so feel free to check those out for like, here's all the things uh, you can do. Um, there's also like a community Slack you can check out. People come in and like ask questions. Uh, we generally respond like super quick. Um, yeah, so that's that's just like a bunch of links. Uh, there's also like a tutorial. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples here, uh, which if you go to the slides you can check out. But there's also sort of like a step by step here is like um, you know like 15 minutes or so you can get a pretty good grasp on it. Um, okay, cool. So here's um, some specific things. Oh hey friends, what's up? Um, okay, so. Let's let's do some examples together. So this is uh, semgrep.dev. It is um, basically uh, going to take uh, a pattern that we're going to write, and then here's a bunch of code that it's going to try to match, and then we're going to see the matches here on the right hand side. Um, so that's basically all it is. Um, okay. So this first example is like let's just think like what if. Um, like, why is this better than grep? Sort of like, you know, very base case. So let's say uh, it's in Python, and we're trying to find all calls to exec because if a user can provide input to it, you know, it's dangerous, right? They could uh, execute arbitrary uh, Python code. So, so probably we'd want to be able to find this one and this one, but like this sum exec, like that's not actually the exec function. Um, we could have white space here. It could be across multiple lines. Uh, it could be in a comment or a string literal. Like, there's lots of cases here that like this would be pretty annoying to create a regular expression to do, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you'd have to take uh, take into consideration white space. You'd have to somehow reason about if you're in a comment or in a string. Like, there's lots of stuff that is going to be like false positive or false negative if you were just to use grep. Um, okay, so basically, how would this look in um, semgrep? So again, uh, semgrep is basically just the language you're searching for with uh, basically two abstractions. So one abstraction is called the ellipsis operator, which uh, is just dot, dot, dot. And what that means is basically you find a zero or more, um, or it's sort of like dot star in a regular expression. So here we're saying find all function calls such that the function called name is exec. Uh, and I don't care about the arguments. There could be zero or more. Um, so if we were to run this pattern, 
we could see that it found exec here, exec here, uh, but not some exec because that's a different name. Uh, it didn't care about uh, the fact that there was white space. And note that we didn't match on uh, the comment because it's not code, and we didn't match on the string because it's not a function call, right? It's just a string. But this first example is pretty cool. So um, this is uh, sort of one of the, the principles of SEMGREP is like, how can we make it like when you write a pattern, we just want it to do what you intended it to do without you having to like codify every case that could possibly happen. So check this out. Basically, you're saying, oh, I'm going to import exec and then locally alias it to this other function called safe function. And then I'm going to call safe function on some user input. But notice how our pattern didn't mention anything about import aliasing or safe function or anything. But SEMGREP is smart enough to know, oh, I can see that locally you've imported, uh, you have an import alias such that exec actually has a different name. So, but I'm still going to match it. Um, so that's pretty nifty. Um, yeah, any questions so far? <clears throat> no, that, that's good. Yeah, that's... I like it. And I totally. like how it's a, it's a smart grep. Yep, basically. Um, we're like, people love grep. Let's build like a better one of those. Yeah. Um, yeah, so let's try. Um... So again, I said there's like sort of two things that are um, uh, basically abstractions on top of a language. So one is this ellipsis operator. Uh, the other is called a meta variable, which you can think of kind of like a capture group in regular expressions where you're like, I don't know what this is uh, ahead of time, but I want to sort of grab a reference to it. Um, so here we have a couple of examples. Um, so this is uh, the Express.js web framework uh, in Node.js. And here we have like, OK, um, we have like this get route um, where we're taking a request. We're basically grabbing. Um, a query parameter, and then directly sending it uh, in the response. So this is potential cross-site scripting. So how would we write uh, a rule like that? Oh, you weren't asking us to answer. Oh, uh, yeah, if you want to. Yeah, go for it. I'm just like, I'm such a teacher's pet. I'm sorry, I cannot help it. I'm just like, oh, oh, like when I used to teach workshops with Nicole, she would ask a question, I'd put my hand up. She's like, dude, stop that. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, feel free. Well, we would want to look to see if they're performing output encoding or not. And we'd want to probably also check to see like if they're doing input validation. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, yeah, those are uh, all great things. Um, so Do we I want guess, more code specific? Yeah, I guess. Um, so conceptually, uh, what's <laughs> happening here is like, you know, there is some route, say some get request. Um, we don't necessarily know what the path is. There could be many paths. We don't care. Um, and the sort of request object might be not might not be called rec. Um, so we're just going to turn that into a meta variable. So this is going to match sort of whatever the first argument to this is. Um, so because we named that uh, rec, we're going to rename this as well. Um, and so the the parameter coming in might not be name. Um, it's like it's like some value, uh, and it's going to get stored into like some variable, and then that variable is eventually going to get output. Um, so basically, meta variables are like I don't know what the value of this is, but like at some point, this is going to happen. So if we were to, um, and then so dot 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 can be not just one or more parameters, but also one or more statements. It's basically like uh, some things happen here is is the uh, program analysis equivalent. Um, Should we put the dot, dot, dots after the res dot right as well? Because there might be more, or is it like, because yeah. you know how like you have the closing of the brackets? Would that help it match more accurately? Or is that not necessary? Um, yeah, so if there could be more statements after res dot right, um, then, then yeah, we would want to match that. OK. Um, cool. Yeah, so we see that we, we are successfully matching this first case, but um, because we're just like taking the URL parameter and directly putting it into the response, but like maybe there's other stuff there, right? So we're not catching this case, even though it's also um, mm -hmm. cross-site scripting. So there is like a special syntax where you can say like, well, it might not be just variable. It can like happen in some complex expression where like variable is like somewhere in that. Um, so you can, I think, it's sort of another special syntax where it's like. 
uh, it's calling res.write, and there's like uh, there's like some like variables like somewhere in there. Um, yeah, yeah. So and then we also catch this case, and and note that like it could also be um, uh, like there could be additional stuff after it, um, but yeah. That's basically the idea. Cool. Cool. There's a, there's a question in the chat that's sort of off topic, but it's a good question. Nikki, do you mm -hmm. want to ask that last sure. chat? Yeah. Have you thought about using this tool in parallel with the MITRE attack framework? Mm, uh, not too much, but I love that idea. Um, Going forward, yes, we have not done that yet, but I, I think that would be excellent. Because um, yeah, it, it does. Yeah, there is like MITRE for a bunch of areas, like detection and response, and I think I saw like a machine learning one and a bunch of other things. Um, yeah, I I see no reason why uh, it could not be applied to any MITRE standard around sort of uh, code security. Um, so not yet, but uh, that's a great idea, and uh, yeah, I'll tell my colleagues that uh, tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. House, yeah. House thank you for the excellent idea. Work. Yeah, I'm Thanks, also Chad. loving how smart this grep is. Good, good question, Chad. Thank you. They'll credit you when they sell it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is awesome. So, Show us more. Oh, sorry, Nikki. Yeah, Nikki. Yeah. No, I, I just have like, so here's a question. It's more, Clint, on how you think about the problem, right? So like in this example, so like if this JavaScript app, right, with the routes and, you know, really just reflecting back untrusted, potentially arbitrary untrusted input, definitely looks like cross-site scripting, right? But back mm -hmm. to the original question, like if the front-end framework, let's just say this thing is shipping itself to a React or Angular front-end, right? And all mm -hmm. of those secure defaults are enabled. Um, and there's CSPs that really restrict script source from loading only from this one page. You know, I mean, I'm not trying to say that this is not a bug. It totally is still a bug, right? But how do you reason that? How does SEMGREP reason that? Or and if SEMGREP doesn't, how do you reason that as a, as a participant in this security ecosystem, does that make sense as a question? Yeah, yeah, that's, no, that's a super good question. Um, yeah, so I would say, sort of like taking a step back from a meta level, um, I, I, I think like another analogous question I've heard sometimes is like, okay, I have like a very high like microservice um, uh, architecture. How do I? Um, like reason about say input coming from like one microservice to another microservice. Like how do I know? It's like okay, well you take user input in this microservice, send it to this other one, which sends it to this other one, and then eventually it does something dangerous. And I think philosophically, for both any uh, dynamic or static analysis tool, you can only reason about um, like the things that you can see. So for example, uh, if you have like a separate React uh, front end that is like unconnected to the um, uh, uh, sort of the backend code that you're analyzing, you can't reason about those together. So I would say basically any tool can only reason about the context with yeah. which you give it. Um, but I would say for me as an AppSec practitioner, I would say if I have very strong sort of invariance or security guarantees about the front end, I would probably just like, yeah, probably we should fix the backend stuff, but I would just um, basically deprioritize that. I would be like, okay, well, what are we like not protected against? And uh, let's right. focus on those. Um, like a more high, impact kind of bug fix versus yeah yeah so yeah, it's, say, it's a hard conversation though because then you sort of look like you're complicit in not fixing cross-site scripting bugs right but and nobody really wants to look like that's the reality <laughs> yeah totally um like one thing that um i think about sometimes is like well what is like the impact or severity of this vulnerability class like say um you know sql injection or cross-site scripting is like high uh impact and high severity however let's say like no user input can ever get to the unparameterized SQL query. So it's like, ah, probably the risk is low. Like impact, if it happens, high. But like realistically, it's like 10 microservices deep. And like we trust all the input going there. So like, ah, we should still fix it. But it's like not, maybe not like critical to fix immediately. Um, I don't know. That, that's my hand wavy answer. Yeah, there's not a good answer there, I don't think. I was just wondering how you reason. Because you seem to reason through a lot of the philosophical problems in this space pretty well. So I was sort of like trying to, you know, see how you thought about that. Yeah, yeah, I think ultimately security is about risk. Like how do we enable the organization to move, uh, enable to do the things it needs to do at an acceptable level of risk? Um, yeah, cool. And we're getting close to the hour, but 
we the hosts are hoping that you're cool with going past the hour i don't know if you have like a hard stop but i just wanted to tell you we have five minutes left but we like if you're up for it we would love to just like have you keep showing us lots of cool stuff uh yeah uh, i'm totally down to continue okay um okay thank you yeah uh, is there <laughs> is there a time uh, you would like to make sure to stop by um because i can like the next hour <laughs> we want to stop before that. Okay, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I mean, I can I can entertain you with uh, juggling for thirty minutes, but uh, other than that, I I think I cannot probably. Uh, yeah. So I okay, just to give okay. you like some context. So this is sort of like TLDR for like well, the rest of the things I have prepared, and obviously we can like talk about anything. Um, basically, like two things. I have like a bunch more examples, and then I'd like to show you um, how to set up. Um, SEMgrep in CI using GitHub Actions in like five minutes, maybe. Um, and then we want to see it. Cool. Uh, and I would also uh, like to try to uh, challenge you all to write a, a rule and then roll out that rule on the GitHub repo that we've added. Uh, and I think that we can do that in about five or six minutes. Cool. Is my cool. is my guesstimate. Um, nice. Cool. So I will um, just just to be uh, respectful of people's time, I'll maybe like show you one more example, and we can like write it together, and then I'll just like sort of show you the solutions to just give you a flavor of like here's other things you can do. Um, so so one thing that I think is um, pretty unique uh, about SimGrep is that because it's so easy and fast to write rules and to prototype things, this allows you to really um, create uh, application specific rules or like org specific rules. Like this isn't a general rule for Java or Python or Django. Like it only makes sense within your company. Like if you think about your organization, there's probably things that like, yeah, like really if you call this API call, you should call this API call after, or like th there's basically just code based specific domain knowledge uh, that you probably want to enforce. At least every company I pen tested, like this is generally the case. Um, so I've basically just created this example to demonstrate like how you can sort of quickly and easily enforce business logic assumptions. Um, so again, not just security. So let's say this is like uh, we have like a financial trading application where you need to call a verify transaction uh, on a, a transaction object before you make the transaction. Maybe it's like vetting to make sure it's uh, properly sanitized. Maybe it's like doing some sanity checks, like whatever. Right. So. Let's say, um, uh, so this method is OK, because it's like, oh, we've called verify before make. Uh, but this method is dangerous, because we're calling make without verifying it first. Uh, this example is dangerous, because it's like we're calling make before verify, uh, and so forth. So it, basically, that's the idea. Um, OK, so how would we create a pattern uh, to find this? So one, one thing that's also neat about SEMgrep is um, it's not just like write a pattern. You can actually compose patterns as well. So you can say like this must be true and this must be true, or this but not that, or this or that or that. Um, so basically, imagine each pattern we've written so far, and then being able to and or 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 like not that an arbitrary number of times. Um, so basically, like what are we trying to find? Like probably um, some sort of function and. Maybe like we don't care what the arguments are, and uh, let's see. Well, what's bad? Like verify. If that happens by itself, it's fine. But like make transaction, like that's bad. So, uh, but it can happen anywhere in the function. Um, so, like let's let's maybe start off by thinking like let's just find maybe like any call any function that calls make transaction somewhere in the body. Um, seems like a reasonable place to start. Yeah. Um, I'm like, oh, I wonder if I have to do point. Yeah, so so one uh, gotcha is that because SEMgrep uh, patterns are basically, say, Python or Java or Golang or whatever, like the pattern needs to be uh, mostly valid in that language. So for example, if you were to write Something like um, just like if this would generally not work because uh, it's not like valid, say Java, you would need something like that. Um, so, so just a pro tip. Um, so sometimes uh, stuff like that will happen. 
Um, okay, so basically now we've called every, we found every function that calls make transaction, but um, there's a lot of cases that we're finding that is like, that's actually safe, right? So all these times that call verify beforehand, like that's fine, so we don't wanna flag it. So basically what we can do is say, find every function that calls make transaction, but filter out basically every function that calls verified transaction before it. So basically, hey, every function that calls make transaction, but filter out, so remove as false positives, all the places where we call verify transaction first. Um, so if we do that, we're like, okay, we did not flag this case, which is nice. fine. We did flag this one. Uh, they're called in the wrong order here. So we did correctly flag this one. Uh, just calling verify, that's safe. So that's cool. Um, there could be other statements in the middle, but that's fine again, because we have this dot, dot, dot operator. Um, this one's called in the right order, so it's fine. Uh, but this last example is pretty interesting. So note that like we're actually calling a verify on this other transaction but make transaction on T. So we're actually verifying the wrong transaction. So, so this is actually a false negative, right? Because we are not finding this when it should be a bug. Um, yeah. So, But again, if we remember our sort of meta variables and we know that they are uh, enforced to be consistent uh, across yeah. within the same pattern. So, so before it was like, these arguments can be whatever you want. But now it's like the first argument to verify transaction must be the first argument to make transaction. So if we do that, we then do flag this last case because other is not the same as T. Um, so yeah, basically we've taken uh, an idea in our hat in our head, like business logic that we want to enforce, uh, and then we basically written a rule for it in like two minutes and like eight lines of code. That's awesome. Yeah, a whole bunch of people totally. are like, we really like this in the chat. All of you. we're all like, ooh, ah, uh, like I and I love how you explain. Okay, so we missed this one. So how can we perfect this so that it works really well? This is I really like this client. I like yeah, it. yeah. Actually, uh, what what someone uh, brought up in the chat earlier, like uh, sort of security adopting DevOps principles. Um, uh, yeah, I think this is totally that in terms of like, I I never feel like oh the first my first uh, draft at a SEMgrep rule needs to be perfect because it takes like two seconds to run it and check, and it takes two seconds to change. So like it's like oh. Uh, I have no idea what this is going to be. Let me pound something out. Okay, cool. It didn't work. Okay, let me make it better. And it's just like, do, 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 and you just keep testing uh, until it does what you want. Um, yeah. Do you have so more Clint, examples that you're going to show us? Yeah, I got a few more. Yeah, Nikki, what's up? Question. Who do you see as like the major author of a lot of these rules? Do you think this development teams themselves or is this like uh, security engineering? I mean, I, there's probably not a great answer to this, but I'm just curious how you see because some of this seems very specific, right? Like for, um, you know, like if, you know, depending on the code base, right? Like that decision has to get made around which rule set to run on. And so they have to be there. I don't know. Do you have any thoughts around, you know, who owns the authorship of a lot of these rules? That's a good question. Um, so uh, <laughs> my, my uh, hand wavy answer is everyone, but but let me, yeah. let me tell you specifically why. So, uh, one thing is people uh, are busy and they want value out of the box. So I think the onus is on uh, R2C and the security community to provide things that are just immediately useful for people. Um, so uh, that's why we invest, uh, we actually have a whole team uh, of people dedicated to writing these rules, um, as well as contributions from OWASP and others. Um, actually one of the top uh, HackerOne Node.js uh, security researchers uh, has been writing a bunch of rules for us. Uh, Node.js scan, the preeminent Node.js security scanner tool. Uh, he, uh, Ajin, ported all of his rules uh, to SEMgrep patterns because they were previously regexes and he wanted to make them more powerful. Um, but I think developers um, realistically are probably not going to write a lot of uh, security rules, but I think that they can, um, like if you already use ESLint or RuboCop or some other linter, um, I've written custom lints for a lot of uh, custom linting, or a lot of just sort of third-party linting tools. Um, and they're very good and powerful, but um, you basically have to learn how to write uh, a check in each of those. Um, and it, it's not easy. Like a lot of uh, even very trivial ESLint checks, I think like the check for like eval is like 90 lines of code or something. Um, so I think our hope is that going forward, developers are like, oh, here's something I want to check uh, for. And then SEMgrep is just the easiest way to do that. 
Um, there's actually, um, let's see. So this is uh, this is the registry. So this is sort of a, a UI for um, the various rules that have been written. Um, so there's like some getting started packs. Like this is some high signal checks for CI. If you're willing to deal with a little bit more noise, but you want to find more vulnerabilities, yep. uh, this is a good one to go with. Um, another thing, uh, I, I'm getting to your answer. Uh, there's like a rule pack in a second I want to show you. Um, but in terms of like enforcing secure defaults, we've been trying to write some patterns for like, hey, here's all the ways to communicate over HTTP and not HTTPS in like five languages. Um, so we basically written checks to say like, if you run this pack, it's unlikely, uh, assuming we have decent coverage, that um, you're not using TLS or you're not disabling TLS cert verification or things like that. And and similarly with like JWT bugs and, and cross-site scripting, um, we basically were like, oh, what are all the ways to turn off output encoding in major languages and frameworks? And we just like wrote rules for all of them. Um, so, but but the reason I brought this page up is um, so Damien uh, is the author of uh, Go Perf Book. Um, so he is not a security person; he is a, a talented GoLang developer. And so he's created this rule pack, um, which is just uh, also a repo on GitHub, um, with basically a bunch of checks. We're like, hey, this is kind of like a Go anti-pattern. Like you probably shouldn't do this. Um, so, and then we have a, a number of checks for like best practices and common bugs and things like that. So I would say. In a company, probably the AppSec team is going to be responsible for, say, codifying um, bug bounty submissions or pen test submissions. Like, let's make sure this doesn't happen again, or let's find other instances of it. Um, but I think given sort of if you can write code, you can write some grep patterns um, that I think developers can enforce, say, code quality or code standards or best practices. Um, yeah. Policy automation for the win. <laughs> that's, the, that's the goal. That's There's awesome. a question that keeps coming so up. Many um, Sarah's there. asking if there's a linter for rule writing. Like if you're so close to getting a rule working, but let's say we were missing that void. Let me put that on the screen. Is there something like that? I think it's similar to what... Uh, uh, yeah. Um, uh, that's a very good question. Um, so the answer is sort of. Um, so we do have a JSON schema. Um, oh, by the way, let me uh, sort of give you a peek behind the hood. So, so we created this like uh, simple editor to make it very like easy, intuitive to get started. But there's a sort of like a vast array of things you can do that are um, more complex. And if you click on this advanced thing, you can see basically every rule is like YAML. So you can see like, oh, we have a series of patterns in a pattern either. And then sort of this is the thing uh, that we want to find. And then we have a pattern not. And this is the code we are filtering. Um, but so. We do have a JSON schema, which can warn you if you are like constructing a YAML that's invalid. Um, and we do have some, um, I think if you go to like tools and maybe debugger, um, I believe that you can see, um, yeah, so it does show you like a step-by-step -step for like what is matching where. Uh, and you can sort of say, oh, my first clause is matching this. My second clause is matching this. Um, but in terms of like um, uh, invalid patterns or things like that, um, we have like some linting uh, tools that you can use, but it's um, it's not quite where we want it to be, to be honest. Um, so we have some things that can give you hints and warnings where it's like, hey, this doesn't look like valid Python. Um, I think we maybe have some prototype stuff that'll maybe point you to a line of code. Um, but yeah, so there are some tools, uh, but but I think there's still a lot that we can do to make it even easier. Cool. Thank you. Good. Cool. Um, yeah. So uh, if there are no more questions, I'm just going to blaze through. There's like uh, 25,000 yeah. questions, <laughs> but we felt like we just really want to see the rest. And it's and then we can do questions after. I sort of told them we would pause questions, for a bit, <laughs> but they could keep putting them in the chat, everyone, and we're going to go back over them. Cool. Yeah, uh, happy to answer all the questions. So let's just like blaze through. Uh, I just wanted to give you a bit of a flavor for uh, some of the more advanced things um, that SEMDREP can do. Um, so sometimes you care about types. So say, for example, we want to find all calls to exec, but only when they're on a runtime type in Java. So basically, there's the special syntax. This works in Java as well as Golang, um, where basically you can say, hey, match exec, but only if it's on a type runtime. So we can see here this argument and this object are both runtime objects. 
but this sort of other object is not. So we did not find this was still a function called exec, but it wasn't on the wrong type, so we didn't find it. Um, so basically, like if you have if you want like type aware queries, you can do that. Um, uh, ooh, I like this example. Um, so uh, I think Sarah had a very good uh, question before this, where she was like, "Hey, what if you have?" What if your organization has like a standard way to handle secrets, um, and like you want to um, basically enforce people are doing that? Um, so one thing that we are very cognizant about at R2C is like we don't want to be another tool that's giving people more work. We want to be a security tool that saves people work. This is like very like ideologically like how do we save people work? Um, so let's say here you have a code base where. Um, someone is like getting, say, an AWS key from uh, an environment variable. Say they're like reading from some sort of like config that's been loaded. But let's say you're like, hey, in our org, we only want to use Vault, which is um, a, a tool by HashiCorp for securely storing secrets. Um, so basically, what we can say is we created this rule. It's like, hey, if your code is like process.env dot some key or config dot get and some key, we actually also have this way to specify an autofix. So you can say, hey, whenever you see one of these things, rep uh, replace it with report.get. And you can actually reuse those meta variables. Like, so we matched key here. So uh, this is not yet integrated into GitHub, but it will be soon. So it, like, when you comment on a PR, it like, lets you like, auto-suggest things. But so if we see here, we found those two. And if we click this Apply Fix button, it's like, bam, bam. OK, cool. Like You didn't have to um, like wow. read a bunch Whoa. of separate documentation. Uh, so that that, that just commits, <laughs> yeah. That, it just commits, or when you're done, you're like, "Here's my semgreps commits, and we're fixing things." So the uh, auto fix, like the auto replace, like uh, is currently. Um, so it, it works right now on semgrep.live. The core logic works internally, but there's some uh, GitHub API finagling we need to do to make it nicely integrated into uh, GitHub's workflow. Um, so. Sort of the technical hard part is there already, but we just sort of need to add um, some API stuff on top to make it play nicely with GitHub's flow. Um, so the answer is it doesn't do this live yet, but uh, it's something we hope to do soon. Wow, that's cool. That's, that's pretty awesome. cool. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, it beats the forty-seven page PDF report, you know, of how to fix everything. <laughs> yeah, because it's like. You know, developers have other stuff to do. So how can we like make it as easy as possible for them to do the right thing? Totally. That that's so cool, Clint. That's very cool. Yeah, I uh, I'm a bit of a fan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, sometimes you want to do patterns on things that um, aren't. Uh, aren't just like one of these programming languages. So we actually have some internal wizardry where you can do semgrep type patterns on like any text file. Um, so here's an example on uh, HTML. So let's say you were like, let's find in HTML all uh, scripts where the source uh, does not have um, some resource integrity. So basically, again, we're finding Oh, this must be left over from the other one. Um, hey, find all script tags, but filter out the ones that have this integrity key. Uh, bam, we are uh, scanning HTML. Uh, maybe you're like, oh, we also have some Terraform, and we'd like to scan that. Um, so you can also do that. Um, so it also works on like JSON or YAML. or um, uh, So because this like generic mode um, is operating on like arbitrary types of files. Uh, you can't do some of the fancy things you can do in like programming languages, um, just because like reasons. I can talk about more if you want, but uh, but yeah. So basically, you can semgraph uh, almost any file. It is sort of the TLDR. Awesome, awesome. Uh, so yeah. Do you want to do questions, or do you want to show us more stuff, or do you want to make us write your rules? <laughs> Let me let me quickly show you uh, getting set up in CI, uh, and then okay. because I yeah. want you to write a rule which then is applied in CI. Cool, um, awesome. Yeah. So so far, I've been just showing you the live editor. We also have this thing called manage. Um, so this is basically like 
hey, I've got a lot of projects. I want to define what I scan where, with what policy, like what rules should run and what should what should they do. Um, so let's just like quickly do that. Um, so I have forked a vulnerable Flask repo, uh, repo from the kind people at We45. Um, so let's add uh, SEMgrep to CI there. Um, OK, so basically set up a new project. Um, the first thing you need to do is create a API token. So basically, uh, when we run SEMgrep as a GitHub action, it's going to talk to this SEMgrep uh, SaaS app and say, hey, I'm this repo. What, what rule should I scan on this repo? And so basically, we just need to give it some uh, a way to authenticate to our server to say, like, here's who we are. Um, so basically, if you go to settings, you go to secrets, click OK. Here's our SEMgrep app token. Just copy this in. Cool. And uh, yeah, so it's like, hey, we uh, collect some sort of data just to improve the service. Uh, by the way, we uh, never send your source code to us. Uh, we are very cognizant. Uh, recently, a number of um, static analysis tool vendors have had uh, breaches or otherwise leaked client source code. So we are like, we want to basically not have any source code that we don't absolutely have to have. So we just like, we're like, what findings happen so we can show them to you in the UI and, and stuff like that. Um, OK, so now we need to set up a GitHub action so uh, that's going to scan every pull request. So if we go back to here, uh, go into the GitHub workflows. Um, so this project actually already had a, a sendgraph.yaml, but let's let's blow it away to, um, to just use ours. Um, so just like copy this config in. Uh, it's basically like use these GitHub actions, pass in um, some environment variables that we set up a second ago, um, just sort of like boiler, boilerplate stuff. You probably shouldn't need to um, uh, change any of these things. Um, so we just like YOLO swag, uh, commit to master, because uh, that's how we do. Um, OK, so now we just want to like commit a sort of obviously uh, vulnerable code. Or uh, here, we're like, 5 equals 5. We have a check that looks for like dollar sign $x equals equals dollar sign $x. So it's like probably you're doing something wrong if you're comparing something to itself. Um, so let's just like add something to this repo that uh, we know will flag. Um, so let's just do that. Um, and you could like add whatever you want. This is just sort of like a very trivial thing that we know is going to flag. We just want to like prove it, prove to ourselves that it's working. Um, OK, cool. So we want to uh, create a pull request. And yeah, sounds good. Uh, so yeah, so I'm going to um, keep this live on this page. Uh, other uh, security scanning tools, when they're giving you a demo, might be like, oh, and then let's cut to the page where it's already ran. Or uh, here's the results if you were to wait for it to run. Uh, but we're just we're just going to chill on this page because um, it's only going to take uh, like a minute or so. And OK, so we're yeah. done here. Wow, um, that was fast. OK, oh, no, uh, no, we're done with uh, that. It, yeah, so if you look, um, yeah, so a lot of the time was actually like loading the GitHub action um, because they have to like oh pull the gosh, file system yes. layers, blah, blah, blah. Um, OK, so it's already scanning. and. Uh, it found the line that we added, and it's been configured to fail the build. Um, so if you go back to conversation, uh, yep, yeah, so it's done. Uh, took about maybe like a minute or so. Um, it commented on the specific line to say, uh, you know, here is what we found. Here's why uh, it's bad. Um, also, we have Slack integrations. So here, um, if you want to say, like, hey, pipe this into Slack for me. Um, basically, it was like, hey, this PR, this was the, the message, and it sort of links you to the file uh, and stuff like that. So cool. if we go back to here, um, oh, yeah. So we've just integrated it into CI on this project. So it took maybe like three or four minutes. Um, so we see this repo. Um, no, it just goes to the repo. Uh, so one thing that I want to call out that I think is pretty interesting is, uh, so basically, the value of um, sort of the web app is like setting what we scan where. 
Um, so here we can see that we're using this R2CCI policy. Um, and you configure it to like, do you want to send me an email or a Slack message? Do you want to block CI, yes or no? Uh, one thing that a lot of companies do is like, you know, there's some things that are like, this may not be a uh, vulnerability, but it's something that the security team wants to know about. So you might not want to block CI, you might want to just like send me a Slack message. So you can do that here if you want to. Um, and basically you could have a series of policies. You could be like, hey, every Django repo we scan with this policy, every uh, Java uh, native client thing, we do this. And basically it just makes it very easy to scan uh, the right thing with the right policy. And, and that's basically the, the purpose of this. Um, Okay, so I think we should write a rule together. Um, well, actually, uh, you all are going to write it. Uh, I will. I will just type for you. Um, so, so here's something that I think is interesting. So, uh, so this is uh, the app. Let me make sure it's big enough for you. Um, so this is a Flask app. Um, we looked at it a little bit. Uh, uh, some Flask type things, I think a little bit ago, perhaps. Um, okay, so here uh, we're defining a route, and it looks like we're doing. Um, uh, so basically, they use JWTs, and they're like, oh, if um, you know, it doesn't have this authorization header, you know, say not not authenticated, but if there is that header, then uh, call verify JWT on that. So. Something that I think would be interesting to write is like find all the routes that are not authenticated, that are not checking um, for this JWT header. So, um, so let's do that together. But really, I want to be lazy. I, I want you to write it for me. That would be great. <laughs> uh, OK, so, so we're going to go to the SimGrep editor. And I'm just going to clear everything out. Um, OK, so let's, uh, let's maybe like copy this guy in. And maybe let's create <coughs> another one. Yeah, so let's say, yeah, so let's say we've got like an unauthenticated route. And, um, it's not going to do this check. Um, yeah, this doesn't really matter, but it's like trying to make it a little more realistic. And then let's say this one is authenticated. Um, and then yeah, like blah blah blah. Assume it does other things below it. So okay, so basically, I want you to find this one, but not this one. Oh, I think you're muted, Tanya, or at least I can't hear you. OK, yeah, that explains why no one was reacting. Um, <laughs> so I think we would start with um, the definition of every function and making sure that the first line is the token equals. Does that make sense? Yeah, like that sounds good. The... OK, I'm going to add another example to make you be a little bit more specific. To mess with me. Yeah. So we don't want to find <laughs> oh, every no. function. We want to find every route. Route, yeah. Oh, OK. But there Maybe is something that's route. making it a route, right? Yeah. OK, so first we find, make sure it's a route. And then uh, we yep. make sure. So how do we make sure everything is a route first? Yeah, so, so first you, oh, sorry, you got a key. Oh, no, I was just going to try to maybe, I don't know. So first look for app.route, iterate through every app.route, and then the the function direct, the definition directly under it, we assume matches that route, or we can mm -hmm. parse the name of the route and then look for that exact name function. But no, yeah. it's not working like that. It's the definition underneath the route is the you know what happens in that route and then i don't know i guess at some point you have to look in that route if you see the token before the return right that's really the core but we want the token to be right after anything important that happens in the route so like if there's route definition and then any sort of action taken other than maybe a printf to the screen so printf's 
that's not a security concern probably, but like oh, I see before any actions happen, we need to authenticate like, uh, we, yeah. So you have authentication and authorization listed. Um, so I'm assuming we get the token to make sure we know who they are and then we're authenticating or which one is doing what? Yeah. We how, how about like, oh, so I think for Flask, it's like whatever, whenever you see at app.route, like the next function definition is the route. So like, yeah. this is a, an assumption I think we can make. Um, okay. So, so yeah, I guess, Nikki, you were saying like, why don't we just find every route and then maybe go from there? That's yeah, nice. sounds pretty reasonable. Unless, in, all right, so fine, maybe we can make, yeah. maybe we uh, avoid uh, options methods and maybe there are certain methods that we care less about, but let's, maybe I'm going too far. Yeah, yeah let's do like yeah. super broad swaths here. Right. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, like this would maybe be like the initial prototype that you would roll out and then make it better over time. So um, I would say like, let's maybe worry about these cases and like we could be like, oh yeah, we'll improve it in a future work uh, TM. Totally. Someone in the chat is suggesting that the method has to be a post, but I would say that a get could also be potentially not good. Um, like if we're posting information to the database or to a form or whatever, we definitely want to make sure we're authenticated. But if we're getting information that is like sensitive in nature, we also want to be authenticated and authorized to view that. So I feel like I'm going to venture out there and say it doesn't matter if it's get or post. It's more about ensuring that it is. Uh, I, I don't know if I should say authenticated or authorized because we want it to be both. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I would agree. I, I think that let's say the HTTP verb here, we want to protect all of them. Um, OK. OK, so, so let's say, so right now, I've just copied the code directly up here. But we want to make it a bit more okay. generic, probably, than just this. So, yeah. so I guess, how would we? sort of abstract away what we have here to make it match like any route. And basically, you have two tools in your tool belt. So ellipses <laughs> and meta variables are basically your two two tools here. So um, do, yeah. We want to make sure it's the same definition, like the same route and definition, but we assume that would be fine. So we could probably do ellipses on that one. Yeah, we can probably just go like that. And so then for the def, like below, we would do ellipses as well, wouldn't we? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually not sure if you can do ellipses for um, function names. We might need to oh, use a meta it. variable here. Oh, OK, yeah. So let's do a meta variable then. All right. Just call it whatever we want. OK. OK. And then for method get, we could probably use dot, dot, dot again, the ellipses. Mm -hmm. Or for the top line, the first line, the get, we could probably replace that with because there's going to be a method equals yeah, and that's happening for sure, but the get could be an ellipses, I think. Yeah, yeah, we could do a couple of things here. We could say like this could be a get or a post or whatever, but there are actually some functions that um, we don't want. We'll do well. No, that are more like you can actually. This is can actually be an array. Um, oh, oh, okay. Nice. So we uh, could do get post, but so then someone can't call like header trace. Uh, yeah, so we can or either... it won't check for those. Well, yeah, I guess I mean if we did uh, just this, but the function was like oh, if it was oh, on both. then we wouldn't okay. Yeah, yeah, because this is looking for just one string, but we might want to say like this could be an arbitrary number of HTTP verbs. Okay, so then that's how we would use an array. Uh, so this is saying like one string could have any value, but if we did something more like this, it would be like this could be anything. Uh, nice. Or if you wanted to be extra lazy, you could just be like, I don't care. <laughs> I don't care about any of it. It's a route. You get the picture. <laughs> okay, um, I like it. Yeah. So let, let's see what's let's see what we're matching right now. Okay. So we're currently matching those. Okay, um, awesome. But like, let's say that, I don't know, this is like something else. Like probably this is too specific, right? Oh yeah, for sure. So we- Manuel saying to remove the single quotes somewhere. Is oh, that, yeah. should it? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I believe when you do app.route, the first argument is a, a path 
And so we might want to, so if it was like, so we could actually do this, um, but we might want to enforce that the first argument is a path. So if this was all just dot, 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 then it would be like zero or more arguments, but we might want to enforce that there's at least one argument and that the first argument is a string. Um, so I don't think you're wrong, but I think that this is a little more precise. Cool. Yeah. Um, so then the, the next thing we want to do, so we've defined the route, and then we want to make sure that it's calling, we want to make sure that it's calling the verification or um, the authorization authentication part. Like, so we want them to get a token and then we want them to check it as the first but, activities, don't we? But we're looking for unauth. So that means oh, we're looking that, for badness. right? We're looking for bad, right? So we're, we want the 200 because that, that shows that is definitely return and i guess we're looking for the absence of the word token and yeah. the 200. yeah so this one's a little bit tricky it's kind of like the make transaction example if you think about it it's like what is everything that's potentially interesting and then we want to filter out the ones that are safe so you could imagine find every route filter out or filter out routes that are authenticated is okay. is one way because it's hard to look for something that's not there so it's sort of like how do we find everything in consideration and then filter out the ones that we know are safe. Okay, so then for the word blurb, we should probably put an ellipses in there. So like it goes from route and the next line. Oh, but the next line could be something else before yeah. it returns that. Yeah, so, so instead. Yeah, so like, uh, you know, it could be like. Um... Yeah, and then that would. So. I think we want to do a code is, but also a code is not. Yeah, uh, I would agree. And the, and the code is not would be the correct version. So we would copy that, but then it would be asking for a token. Because um, if it's not asking for a token, it's for sure wrong. And so, returning a 200. Yeah, and returning a 200. Good call. Sorry, uh, what do you want me to change for the 200? Uh, so we want you to add the 200 at the, um, at the no, bottom yeah. of the is not. Yeah. So basically the good pattern is it, so the first two lines are fine, but the pattern is that whatever it wants to happen, so like you do the app route and then the def, and then from there, ellipses, like we don't care, there could be something, there could not be something, but that, Oh no, it's in the is not for the, I guess I just like focusing on the is not. So in the is not section, oh, did <laughs> you would say? have the, so there'd be the first two lines at the top. So def, so app.route in the is not, and then def fetch. Right, like, yeah. Make, and, make it and, the same. Yeah. It's, Exactly. Like, I guess you could copy the top, <laughs> the top three lines that are in the code is. Um, and so then after that, so this, so if you add a new line between def route and the token line. Yeah, so and then ellipses there. So there could be an, an untold number of lines. We're not sure yet, Clint, but okay, yeah, yeah, I like it. And then we want to see that they ask for a token and then they get a 200. That is a yeah, good and then call, right? Maybe the 200 should be in the code is. Right? Yeah, so return. Well. Yeah, but I don't know. Not everything returns like JSON. So it could return all sorts of stuff. So maybe return ellipse that whole thing and then a 200. And then I'm thinking if there are other yeah. 201, 202, none of those would, eh, maybe 200, 20 ellipse. Yeah, yeah, how like about something 200 like? Yeah, so if you think about it, like let's say the user is trying to like modify an object they don't have control over, then like probably we would give them like a like a 403 or something. So like even if we do authenticate them, but if they're trying to do something they shouldn't be able to, they might not get a 200. So I, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, I feel like this is maybe specific enough because we don't necessarily know the route could legitimately return not a 200 based on user behavior. That's um, true. And the, the main star of the show here is the token. Yeah, I think the token is sort of the, is sort of the key part here. Um, so I don't know. So okay. I'm just going to run what you've given me. And OK, um, okay looks like we found these uh, unauthenticated routes. 
we did not flag this one. Um, so yeah. But, but we were too specific in copying those. Like if you think about it, we can't have header requests. Uh, I mean, I, I, I would say that like header requests get authorization seems good, but if not taken, um, I think like we could have like a bunch of different things there that would be correct, but basically it's important that they are calling the token and that if they call the token and it's good, they progress. And if they don't, it, and it's not good that they do not progress. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, I think this is like pretty good as is if we wanted to make it a little bit better, um, we could do a couple of things. Like we could say, um, like, the currently we're assuming that the actual variable name is like token. So we could maybe replace this with meta variables because like the developer might call it whatever they want. Um, cool. We could say like, we don't know what's in this JSONify, but like maybe we care yeah. about the 403. So there's like, there's like some things we could do, um, but I feel like this is actually pretty good. Oh, um, awesome. So, so cool. Uh, I'm super excited about this. So, so let's like make this a little bit more real. Um, so we could say, if we pop over to advanced, we can say like um, Flask unauthenticated route. So this is like a rule ID. Um, mm -hmm. We could say um, you just added a route that does not do a WT uh, auth check. Um, please yeah. consult with security. Uh, to confirm that this is expected behavior. Mm -hmm. So if we run this, um, uh, we can see that what I just typed in, the message, is what's going to get shown to the user. Nice. Um, oh, but actually, uh, check this out. Um, so see how we were grabbing the name of the method? So you can actually yeah. use meta variable values in the message. Mm -hmm. So if we just say, hey, uh, you just added a route. Oh, cool. Oh, and then add the name. Nice. So it's more clear for them. Yeah. So yeah, we can maybe add like a little extra parentheses. So hey. and if, if you're running this in a pipeline, does the return like, does it return like net, like nice, well-formed JSON to like the Jenkins, wherever you're spitting the output of your CI tool? So it's not like exit code zero. Have a nice day. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. The results uh, will just go straight to JSON. Okay, cool. Uh, so yeah, so That's we can cool. see here the uh, routes that we matched uh, are just getting interpolated into there. Oh, I love it, Clint. That's awesome. And customized error messages, so they actually make sense to the devs. So sweet. Yeah, we and probably also add to that. Like you know, you did not do this. Please consult with the security team to confirm that this is expected behavior, or add the add the authentication check because it's probably that they forgot, right? Yeah. yeah why don't we just do that? Um, please add the token. Oh, you know, add the add the auth, or talk to the security team about why you may not want to have this. Like they yeah. might have a good reason, but probably they just forgot. Yeah, why don't we just add that in there? Cool. Cool. I like it. Yeah, I don't know. We'll see how this shows up on GitHub. Hopefully it'll be nicely read in Markdown, but let's just try. This might not work well. Okay. I haven't tried this actually. Uh, okay. Uh, cool. So another thing that's kind of neat, you can name your snippets that you write. So you can just say, cool. This is the name can now. We, can we turn rules off and on if we need to for some reason? Mm -hmm. Like, is that a possibility? Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So here um, you could say, like, uh, turn on or off different rules. You can do, like, by path. So you could say, like, oh, this is, like, a known issue or this is, like, this on this code base is super noisy. Um, you can also sort of like whitelist individual findings by doing a, sort of an inline comment in the source code to say like, don't warn on this one because you know it's it's not actually a thing. Um, so yeah, you can turn on or off rules uh, just through here. Cool, very cool. 
Um, okay, so we've uh, written a rule. So it's time to uh, deploy it to the app we've already configured. Um, I hope that you are uh, ready to set your timer because let's add this to the thing we're scanning. So I just went up to add to policy, clicked on my uh, getting started policy. And if we go back to here, refresh. Uh, cool. So now we're going to scan this repo with not just R2 CCI, but also this rule that's custom to this code base that we just wrote. Um, like basically, uh, you don't have to change the GitHub action, just it'll pull whatever your latest policy is from the web app. Um, so cool. So let's see this in action. Yeah. So this demo is almost over. Do not fear. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate everyone for uh, staying so long. I'm glad to hear all the questions. Um, so basically, I've just added our test cases um, in the repo. Um, so I added a new route that is authenticated. I added two new routes that are not authenticated. And if I create a new branch for these changes, and then create the pull request. Nice. Okay, cool. So, so basically, what happened is we reviewed the source code, and we're like, hey, this is an interesting thing. Like, Maybe it's not necessarily a bug, but as a security professional, it's something I would want to know about. Um, so we yeah. copied some of the code into semgrep.live. We iterated for a few minutes. We did like a one-click add to my policy that's already scanning the repo. Uh, and then now, henceforth, on every new pull request uh, to this repo, it's going to be scanned with this. Um, cool. So as we, uh, yeah, uh, any questions while we wait a minute or two? Uh, so yeah, Sarah had a good one, just go again. <laughs> um, yeah, and question. speaking of results, uh, Jason, does SEMGREP provide any kind of reporting, dashboarding, or are the JSON results typically piped into another tool like Defect Dojo that we spoke about earlier? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, oh, and it's done. Um, oh, so here it found the two uh, unauthenticated routes that we added. It commented. If we look in Slack, it's giving me an update that there's these unauthenticated routes. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, it seems like inline markdown, we need we need to troubleshoot this uh, a little bit. But um, yeah, so uh, the dashboard that you see here, um, we have a, a number of um, like figures and stats and metrics and things that um, basically you're going to get out of the box here in this dashboard. Um, it's not quite live yet. Um, we're still working on it. Um, we also can output in the serif format, uh, S-A-R-I-F, which is uh, if your tool outputs in that format, you can um, sort of like auto import that into sort of GitHub's uh, code security view. Um, so you can see that within uh, there. Um, yeah, so basically, we're building a dashboard, um, and it's easy to sort of pipe the JSON into other dashboards if you so wish. Um, but if you don't want to run a separate thing, uh, that'll be live um, in the SEMGREP dashboard uh, soon. Cool. I noticed in your uh, documentation that says it does integrate for notifications in Defect Dojo already. Nice. Yeah, and I, sh I shared the link in the chat. And then I added the link to our page of links, Nancy. Good job, Tanya. <laughs> good, thank you. Um, there was another good question um, by Anish asking, does SEMGREP uh, have support for Terraform, Kubernetes, IAC scanning for misconfiguration? I was also thinking with things, with tools like Pulumi that uses, you know, you can write your IAC with Python or any like the language of your choice. Could you leverage SEMGREP to create your own rules? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, SEMGREP has like stronger support for, um, or like like meta variables and ellipses and things like that. Um, uh, you can do them most effectively in sort of officially supported languages like, you know, Golang, Java, JavaScript, Python, TypeScript, blah, 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 and so forth. But you can use SEMGREP to scan uh, any file. So um, Terraform, Kubernetes, YAML, like any of those plain text files you can scan uh, today. Uh, we do have some rules uh, written for them already, but um, uh, it's not sort of currently been a focus, but uh, it works already, and we're going to add more rules uh, in the future. 
Um, and yeah, Pulumi, if like you are using, say, Python or JavaScript or just any programming language that SimGrep supports, uh, yes, uh, that should work. Cool. Yeah. This has been such a ridiculously over-the-top, amazing, yeah. awesome SaaS. Someone's like, yeah. for a workshop, this is great. And yeah, we tricked you. And someone else is like, it needs to come back for a whole day. Like. <laughs> Yeah, so I yeah. don't know, Clint. It seems like people are really like really liking this a lot. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'd uh, I'd be happy to sometime. Um, yeah, that would be fun. Uh, I, yeah, I've really appreciated all the questions. Uh, awesome. They've been excellent. Yes, that was great. Thank you, Clint. I want to wrap up because I know Nikki has to jump, and we all have yeah. to continue with Sorry. our day. Yeah. No, that's I'm okay. I'm gonna get kicked we... out of this room. That's what's gonna happen. <laughs> uh, that's okay. But thank you, everyone. But before we went, wrap up, I just want to mention a few things that we have coming up um, on. Wednesday, we have this workshop. It's full, but we will publish the, um, the recording on our on our website. Also, oh, what do we have coming up? The supply chain cyber attacks compromised compilers by Negar and Nushin Shabab coming up also on the 22nd. And we also will open registration soon for a DevOps CTF uh, with Renan Diaz from Dojo with Renan um, going on on December 6th. So please register, follow us in um, on all our social media, Meetup, LinkedIn, um, Twitter, and uh, you will know about what's coming up. Um, so that was for wrapping up. Anything else from the chat? Any final words, word, Nikki, before you go? No, this was great. I mean, I think everyone collectively all feels that way, that this was a great tool to demo. And Clint, you did a great job uh, showing it off. Oh, yeah. Thanks yeah. so much. Uh, I, I have a quick answer for Subtle Ash the Immortal. Uh, excellent name. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we we are um, going to show people, AppSec teams as well as developers, like fixed rates and other metrics in terms of like what are we finding the most of, how fast are people fixing it, what's uh, the open number of issues over time, How what's sort of the burn down rate. Uh, yeah, all those metrics are, are coming. Excellent. Awesome. So, awesome. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I had a blast. Super. So like we said in the beginning, or like Tanya said, everything uh, we talked about will be in the show notes. We have a bunch of links. I think uh, even in, in Clint's um, slides, there's a bunch of links that you would want to, to look up. So uh, we'll put that. Uh, thank you, everyone. We'll see you next week. Um, and that's it. Have a good one. Also, oh, did you have anything everyone, else? Go ahead. Yeah. Everyone subscribe to our channel. <laughs> everyone follow us on Twitter. Everyone click the thumbs up button because Clint deserves at least five thumbs up per person. And also <laughs> sign up for the newsletter TLDR Sec, which is yes. in the chat. Yeah. Everyone sign up right now. We are all signed up and not just because we're friends with Clint, but also because it's ridiculously informative and helpful. And funny. So, so funny. <laughs> yeah, oh my gosh. He makes me laugh every week. It's awesome. So do yourself a favor and sign up for this awesome free newsletter. Okay. Thank you everyone for coming. Bye. Thanks. See you next time. Have a great